Great, excellent. Good, good evening, everyone, and greetings uh, from Nairobi, Kenya. My name is uh, Awino Kech. I'm an associate professor in political sociology in the Department of Politics and International Studies, and I'm also the associate director for Equity and Accountability. It gives me great pleasure to say a few words to open uh, this event and then hand it over to those who have a lot more to say than I do. The title of this event is called Unfinished Business, LGBTQIA plus Voices of the Revolution. This is a SOA special event series that builds on global LGBTQIA plus solidarity and is hosted by Dan Glass, who is a SOAS community fellow, who is an award-winning activist, mentor, performer, and writer who uses music, performance, and protest to catalyze love, soul, revolution and justice in communities confronting injustice. Uh, Dan Glass has graciously brought two SOAS and to us this evening, Katleho, who will be speaking with us. Um, again, let me say Karibuni Sano to SOAS, for those of you who are physically in the room and those who are far away virtually like me or in London, but virtually joining the event. I do look forward to tracking and following the conversations. Once again, welcome, Dan. Uh, again, welcome, Katleho, and uh, let's get right into it. Oh, thank you so much, Awino. Thank you. Can you hear us all right, Awino? You can hear it. Thank you so much. That was really lovely. That was a really lovely way to start. I'm not going to take too long because um, we've got Kat with us tonight. Um, I just want to introduce the kind of concept that we've been working together on the programme. Um, so this year is the 50th. You just say who you are. Oh, I'm Dan Glass. Um, we met five years back. Um, six. With six? Yeah. Oh my God. Where's the time going? With um, Queer Tours of London. And um, we did a specific project within that called Unfinished Business, LGBT Voices of the Revolution. And then fast forward six years, a lot has changed. But this year was the 50th anniversary of the Radical Roots of Pride um, in 1972. Um, and the mission has always been absolute freedom for all and has always been anti-racist and anti-imperialist since it began in 1972. Very different from corporate pride, which was on July the 2nd, we were on July the 1st. Um, and so this series, which thanks to Angelica and thanks to a lot of other people in SOAS, looks at how we can specifically carry on um, challenging the British empires, um, one of the most successful exports of homophobic legislation, um, and Kat has been a formidable activist in Botswana, in London, and across the world for LGBTQIA plus rights. Um, the next um, event that we have is November the 29th with um, Jason Jones, who wrote um, the legislation to overturn homophobic legislation in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so Jason will be joining us on um, November the 29th, really to like understand and explore more about how we can live in solidarity um, and build connections and build successful campaigns. As I don't know if you've seen it, but the most beautiful picture of, of Kat, when I didn't, I didn't know a lot of what was going on behind the scenes, and I'll get it up in a second, Kat holding the pride flag in the courtroom, correct me if I'm wrong, in Botswana. So, oh my God, that made my year. Um, and, you know, in our lifetimes, we can um, see the overturning of a lot of these homophobic legislations. Even in the last year, there's been Singapore, Botswana, Trinidad and Tobago. There's still 69 across the world, mm. 41 in the Commonwealth. Didn't, was it Cuba or Costa Rica who just overturned? The family One planning law. Yeah. The so. family planning law in Cuba, yeah. So things are changing. And so the next two hours, the suggestion is how we can continue building solidarity from all of our countries, from all of our networks, and learn and deepen our toolkit for overturning homophobic legislation. I was going to read um, this section about cat in my- Read it, read Should it. I read it? Because <laughs> one of the last- Say where it's from first. Okay. The la one of the last images of cat um, where it's so nice to be back together was, um, I can't remember, you were walking down the street with a whole set of balloons strapped to your back. That was after Adaronke's uh -huh. uh, confirmation yeah. of um, being able to stay yes. in the UK. Yes. And then we were taking down all the decorations. 
And I was like, where are these balloons gonna go? Oh, yeah. And so I, you will read the passage. And just left walking down the street with balloons. Please tell, tell the people where it's from. Okay, so this was our friend Adoronke. No, I mean the book. Oh, the book is called United Queerdom from the Legends of the Gay Liberation Front to the Queers of Tomorrow. And I wrote that um, really in tribute to the people who founded Pride. So it's interviews, and again, I say radical Pride, not corporate Pride. Um, and it was interviews with them, four mainly, um, as well as 64 younger generation LGBTQIA activists from a range of movements, UK Black Pride, Lesbian and Gay Support, the Migrants, um, African Rainbow Family, um, to really kind of explore what the 50th anniversary of Pride means. My next book, which is just coming out next spring, is Queer Footprints, is a, is a walking tour guide of, of queer London. Um, so I'm excited about that. Um, but this was a kind of excerpt of Kat's tour, which was called Unfinished Business, LGBT Voices of the Revolution. So this was, this came out to 2020, but this was actually from 2017, I believe. Yeah. So we were standing outside the Royal Courts of Justice um, at the, at the, in Temple, um, where our friend Adoronke, a leading um, queer activist, was defending her right to get asylum. Um, she's Nigerian. Um, and the, the judge famously said, um, how can you be a lesbian if you've got children? Um, so this is how ridiculous and awful um, the British state is. Um, so this was Kat. Welcome everyone to Queer Tours of London, Queer Freedom Everywhere special with your fabulous tour guide Kat. I would like to start with my interpretation of the poem Caged Bird by poet Maya Angelou. The caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still, and his tune is heard on the distant hill for the caged bird sings of freedom. So thank you for coming out on this cold, rainy afternoon when we could have easily hidden under the covers. But maybe you're as sick of hiding depressed under the covers as I am, as I'm sure many of us are. Today, I'm so chuffed. This is me speaking in, about myself, it's embarrassing. <laughs> um, today, I'm so chuffed to be standing next to Kat, members of the LGBTQIA plus community and supporters from various Commonwealth nation diasporas are standing outside the Ugandan embassy on a blowy and bright winter's morning to pay tribute to the groundbreaking work of Ugandan queer and HIV and AIDS activist, David Kato. It is the eighth year since he was, have people heard of David Kato? La pioneering Ugandan queer and HIV activist. It is the eighth year since he was bludgeoned to death in his home in 2011. He was murdered just weeks after assisting in securing a high court that printed the names, photographs, and addresses of gay people that explicitly called for their execution. Call Me Kuchu is the film that this is um, explored in. The huge crowd is from Uganda, Bangladesh, Nigeria, Russia, Trinidad and Tobago, and the UK. People have come with sponges to wash the homophobia off the embassies we will visit. The atmosphere is electric, unpeeling multiple layers of structural injustice and the innate truth that queer story is told by those who write it, means that there are always people and communities whose story is traditionally left out of the picture. Like the trans community, people with HIV, queer migrants or David Cato, until someone kicks off. The crowd surrounds Kat and first to pay tribute to David Cato is Edwin Sasanje of African Equality Foundation. Um, Edwin says, the fight claimed David Cato's life. This is why we launched a movement driven by refugees and asylum seekers, adamant at speaking out for themselves instead of being spoken to or about as vulnerable people. A strength perpetuated by Kato, Kato's example. Kato's activist legacy and the reality of his absence wrought memorable loss. The loss of David is a tragedy for the activism he would surely have instigated, as well as being a point of uprising amongst freedom fighters who challenge injustice in his name. He was murdered for being queer, his surviving family endangered. The target of the tour is a common conference taking place that week. The Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting or Chogham conference is here. And we are on the streets of London to agitate for a global movement of creative activism to decriminalize homosexuality everywhere. Kat shouted across the crowd and then read a message from Gay Liberation Front activist and campaigner Peter Tatchell that was sent for the occasion. 
The Commonwealth is a bastion of homophobia. In defense of human rights of principles of the Commonwealth Charter, 37 out of the 53 Commonwealth countries criminalize LGBTQIA plus people. Nine use life imprisonment. In parts of two countries, Pakistan and Nigeria, the death penalty can be used. Even more Commonwealth countries fail to protect queer people against discrimination and hate crime and reject dialogue with their local queer organizations. For six days, for six decades, the leaders at Commonwealth summits have refused to discuss, let alone support equality for the estimated more than 100 million queer citizens living in the member states. Fresh after a night out, uh, favorite karaoke bar and cover which karaoke bar? <laughs> Don't know. Have a think. Then maybe we can go back tonight. Yeah. Um, favorite karaoke bar and covered in. I think it was in summer. Covered yeah. in a bundle of balloons. Cat radiates good energy. Love, in many different ways, has been tattooed on her body as it is her compass. Neck, arms. Neck. <laughs> um, after so many devastating sharings of homophobia from around the world, Kat's outfit is exactly what the crowd needs to lift their spirits. So many great revolutionary movements to overturn injustice look fabulous. We can look to the hot pink sari wearing Galabi gang in India defending against rapists, to the traditional African cloth of the Black Panthers war to promote racial pride or to the ACT UP AIDS coalition to unleash power activists with their tight graffiti art t-shirts. Shall I finish? I can go for ages. We're good. We're good. We, we're, we good. Go for ages. we're good. Yeah. We're good. We're good. Thank you. Yes, applause for Dan. This is the book for the people online. Yes, no, I, I was keeping myself out of it until, <laughs> no chance. until the time to have <laughs> us together. Thank you so much. Where Just, can they buy the book? Where can you buy the book? Gays, the word bookshop around the corner, Houseman's Bookshop. Um, we've got the new Beacon Bookshops in Finns. Park, which is the last remaining, do people know New Beacon Bookshops? Love that place. It's the last remaining radical black history bookshop in London, um, 73 Stroud Green Road. A lot of the independent bookshops, but also the mainstream bookshops as well. But one last question from my end. Um, imagine it's seven o'clock today. Um, what are the specific questions that you want answered? Because there's so many things that we could talk about and explore. Um, are there specific questions, specific areas that you have like got a passionate inquiry or just a little inquiry in? And don't be shy, there's no room for shyness here. Um, go straight in. Yeah, I guess the question is, do you have something that you're thinking about that you might think that I would have an answer to? And if I don't have an answer, I'll, I'll, I will tell you, I don't have an answer to it. <laughs> but otherwise, I am a thinker. That is what I do. That is what makes me happy. Um, yeah. Dan and I will spiral off into a conversation, which will hopefully incite you to ask questions. Just in case you, just to reread Cat's biography no, again. No, no we don't do that. Okay. Um, okay. I'm not my bio. <laughs> the buy is what gets people here but when i'm here it's just me so no questions no questions no inquiries we're starting on a blank old slate great let's go let's go what was it like in the courtroom in botswana when you heard the legislation to overturn criminalization was was real and what was your role in it and what can we learn from that so it was very interesting because uh, 20, this happened in 2020. The picture was taken in 2019. Uh -huh. um, but the decriminalization happened in 2021. So 2019, I was a fellow with Outright Action International, um, which is uh, the only accredited, UN accredited LGBTQ plus human rights focused um, organization in the world. So I was a fellow with them, which meant I got access to the UN system, got to do a little bit of advocacy, managed to sit on um, two different panels. The first one was the first panel 
that focus on trans lives ever to be hosted in the UN General Assembly building. Uh, and that was sponsored by Argentina, Argent I think Argentina and Malta. Um, so that was already, I was like, oh my God, yes, making history. We get to talk about trans lives because trans lives actually matter. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the second panel was one of the most amazing moments that I've ever had in my life because we were with UN women and we had, we were talking uh, trans lives and non-binary lives. Um, and so Pumzile Mlambonika was on the panel with me. Um, Gina Rosero was on the panel with me. I was on the panel. Uh, I think the representative from Argentina was on the panel and then two other people, including Kay Willande um, Barnett uh, was on the panel. And that panel, the most fun thing, if you can imagine the United Nations, right? And the reason I'm going to the United Nations before I go into Bolsonaro, is I want to paint a picture. This is the United Nations. Everybody's walking around in their blue or gray or black suits with ties and otherwise, you know, you know, looking either looking very dowdy or super, super like, oh, I'm at work. And for that particular panel in the General Assembly building, Outright had said to the entire queer community, do you wanna come through? Let's go. So we had people in drag coming through. We had people in full face. We had all sorts of just the diverse spectrum of trans and gender diverse persons walking through these halls while all these other people who are just like, you know, I'm in my suit and my tie and I've got a briefcase were walking about. And being able to be part of that history was one thing. But being at home and hearing a person whose responsibility as a legal practitioner or an officer of the law, mm -hmm. who bears a name from Botswana, mm -hmm. saying, my favorite part of the, the ruling was, <laughs> If a law no longer serves the people it's meant to govern, then is it not fit for a museum pet? Oh, wow. And that was quite literally just the commentary on the fact that why are we holding things that actually don't matter to us anymore within the African continent, within our context? Um, why is it that we brought something that should be in a museum, but we still use it to hang over people who are living now. Mm -hmm. Not an idea of people, but people who are actually alive. Yeah. So being in that courtroom and hearing that was, it was, it, it, it felt as if I was watching a film. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause I was like, wait, 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 that's when I can think like this, mm -hmm. right? Because too often again, we get taught that, um, in this very obedient uh, or like we always must obey culture. All of a sudden somebody is not obeying yeah. Yeah. by saying, well, actually I have the power mm -hmm. and I have the knowledge and I have all of these other things. So I'm not gonna sit and say, oh, I should be scared of the, the people. Mm -hmm. And then what happened in 2021 when the Court of Appeal finally um, put their stamp on, because in Bozana you've got the High Court and then you've got the Court of Appeal. High Court can make all of the rulings for everything. It's high, the High Court rules over customary as well as like the Roman Dutch law. Bozana is unique in the fact that we have two different legal systems. And so and they're both valid. So the traditional customary law is not subservient to Roman Dutch law in Bolzano. You can get a customary law ruling and that's it. But customary law rulings can always be appealed to the High Court and the Court of Appeals. Um, so when it was said that like, 
here we are at the Court of Appeals and the Court of Appeals said, we uphold what the High Court has said. Um, and one of the major things was, if you keep saying Botswana isn't ready or Botswana are not ready for legal reform, who are these Botswana? Because if the president can mention it, if it can be in the newspapers, if it can be on the media, if we can have all of these social cultural events, which Botswana are you waiting for? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just curious, thank you. Um, who else is from a country where it currently is or was is was previously um, criminalized? To be, homosexuality was criminalized. Which countries have we got here? India, India, yeah, Zimbabwe. So we're still West. current. We're still West current Rana. with Zim. Ah, <laughs> Botswana, oh. yeah. Wow, India. Cool. And were you following the the changes in Botswana when it happened? Okay, you, not... <laughs> I'm not going to out you. Don't worry. Okay, I'm great. Not out you. <laughs> well, I, don't, I don't know what Kelly's but, talking about. No, 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 no. Wow. Um, but yeah, so it, it, it was very interesting um, and sort of, I guess, to preempt your next question <laughs> around, because Dan and I will sit and like do this business the entire evening, um, to preempt the next question, which is around, but how does it happen? Mm -hmm. You know, very often right now, um, civil society is losing so much space. If anybody, do we have any people who are like whole card holding British people in the room? like you are a person who is british <laughs> got okay. a few got a few right yeah. so um i'm sorry to disillusion you if this is a disillusionment but uh the uk for all that it has done to sort of kind of maybe <laughs> uh, <laughs> grant uh some kind of safety or even like dignity to LGBTQ plus people um, from the UK, never mind people who are coming into the UK, is doing a terrible job of it. Uh, so this is also one of the roots of the Unfinished Business Tour, was that um, under Queer Tours of London, which is an initiative that uh, Dan and a few friends founded a few years ago, which I used to, so I ran a tour, which was around, the, it was the decriminalization tour. It was a Commonwealth decriminal tour um, where we were focusing on the different milestones along the way of um, what, where UK history, legal history and general cultural history were intersecting. So for example, it was only in 1990 that the World Health Organization removed homosexuality from um, the list of mental disorders, right? So that's 1990. Anybody born within five years of proximity to 1990, put your hands up. Be most people. So either side, either side of that. So either 1985 or 1995. Everyone's after 1995, mm. right? Right. No, no, not everyone. Like, they're, they're, people, they're people who want. Oh. <laughs> You're the only person born in like the 30s, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, at the time that you were born, there was still like people fighting about whether or not you were insane because you were homosexual, right? And the UK with um, Section 28. When was Section 28 re repealed? 2003. 2003. Yeah. Section 28 was a clause that was introduced by Dan's least favorite person. Margaret Thatcher. One of Dan's least yeah. favorite people yeah. um, that forbode um, people from teaching anything regarding sexuality, gender. So SRHR right now, y'all are like, oh yeah, SRHR, that's great. No, you, you would have gone to jail. Um, as a teacher, you would have been fired for simply giving knowledge uh, to people. So anything that you see right now happening in, again in America, where they're trying to stop critical race theory and all those sorts of things, um, that was already law in the 90s in the UK to say, don't you dare tell children that it is possible <coughs> for people to 
even get divorced, never mind be attracted to people that are not their own partners that they've had children with. So the family is still this one thing. Um, and Section 28 has had its own repercussions. Um, it is still lingering. The anti-buggery laws, the well, the buggery law, which was what, 1553? 1533. 1533. Think how long ago 1533 was? 1533. Yeah? 15. Not 19, not 17. 15. This is what? The 16th century. Mm. 16th century. We're in the 21st. So five centuries ago, this law was brought into ideation and then brought into effect five centuries ago, 500 years ago. Yet today, people are being like slaughtered with machetes because they are queer. And that didn't happen. The thing happening today is not because Oh yes, we don't believe in it. It's because 500 years ago, a law came into effect and then a few explorations happened. And then Jesus Christ, the Lord and savior with the golden locks and the white robe with the sandals um, was then everybody's Lord and savior, right? And that Lord and savior, for some reason, even though he had queer friends, Read the Bible, it's there. Even though he had queer friends, apparently is the reason people are slaughtering people with machetes today about a thing 500 years ago. Botswana inherited our bit in 1883. 1800s, guys. Do people not get tired? Do we, honestly, like, do people not get tired? Because, like, it's, it boggles the mind to think that something that old could be used as, no, but this is what we believe. Yet we don't believe in, you know, riding horses because it's much easier to catch the tube. <laughs> we're fine with the tube, but we're not fine with horses. Yeah. Like, we're not fine with, like, homosexuality being a thing. Yeah where people are just able to be just that. Yeah. Without being possessed by demons, without being anything else or mad or whatever. So yeah, this is how we ended up with unfinished business because there's so much business and a lot of this business really does stem from 1533. And thank you, Chad. I know that um, I'm a bit curious to what subjects people are doing here. Just shout out. Or fields of interest. Fields of interest. Anyone at all. Who are we talking to? Wow, that's an undergraduate or a master's in anti-imperialism, anti-colonial. Uh -huh. ah, wow. Okay. Cool. Wow. Amazing. Um, yeah. What other subjects or, or interests have we got in the room? Law and what? Law and gender. Law and gender. Amazing. Sex work. Is that a master's? In sex work. Amazing. Wow, this institution. This is good. why everybody, every time they really heard my qualification, they were like, are you going to sew us? Like, yeah, no, like, nice. It sounds very sew us. <laughs> that is so good. <laughs> Mind you, I did a master's in human rights, culture, and social justice. So, yes, it sounds very sew us. Wow. I went Sussex for my undergraduate, but our friend Andrea Cornwall, who just left last year, was an old friend from Sussex, and, and she brought us here as a community fellow. And the reason why I asked that is, the thought in my head is about um, NGOization, which I'm sure most, if not everyone knows. Can someone tell us quickly, in brief, how you would explain NGOization of development? And I know that there's no specific words for it, but how would anyone, someone explain it? Speak a bit louder. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, big time. Yeah, to no. some degree. Yeah. Anybody yeah. else? So if you think of the NGOization of development, what are you thinking? Because again, this is where we're going to go with this chat. It's, it's a segue towards that. Is there anybody online? If you're online and you want to say something, please let us know. Um, in five, four, three, two, one. That's all right. No, it's not a, it's not a class, it's not a lecture. So, um, so the NGOization of development is, from a critical perspective, the observation that um, there are many states that choose to not or sidestep doing the work. So for example, in Botswana, um, 2017 was a great year for trans folks and gender diverse persons because two cases were heard in that year. And those two cases were two trans diverse persons um, who wanted to have their gender markers changed on their identity documents. One of them chose to withhold their identity. The other one was a, turned into a bit of a, a national spectacle. It was a trans woman who wanted to have her gender marker changed. Um, and it just so happened that it coincided with the fact that she was also engaged to be married. Um, so technically for the state, it would have still been a heterosexual marriage, right? If they had had it done before, well, after the gender market change, because prior to the gender market change, then it would have been like, oh, you can't get married because we don't believe in same-sex marriage. It's like, well, you can't say same-sex marriage because like, that is not my, that is not who I am. <laughs> so yeah, it's not real. So 2017, we had the first, the ruling with the person who chose not to disclose their identity, they got their gender market changed. And then when it came time for the public case, which is the Riki Hositao case, um, she was given a settlement out of court by the government, which means we don't have a ruling for that. And the reason they gave the settlement out of court as the government of Botswana, they said, oh, no, 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 no. We're already working on these things now. It's five years later. You still need to get a court order to get your gender marker changed in Botswana. And getting a court order is not cheap, it's not easy, and you have to be in a city to do it. You can't just be in a village and be like, oh, I'm writing a letter to the court. So that's one thing. Second thing is, um, even within the acknowledgement of trans persons in Botswana, they're really only recognized by the courts and only by certain legal practitioners based on those two cases. Nobody else exists as a trans person in the eyes of the law outside of that in Wuhan. And so that's part of why the, the work of you know, initiatives such as this um, exists because very often folks think that because there's been a victory of sorts at one time, it means everything is fine and nice for everyone. Just recently, there was a conference that was meant to be held here in the UK called Safe to Be Me. Um, and again, that's, there's a reason I was asking about who is a card-holding British citizen. Uh, it was meant to bring people from all across the world into the UK and talk about LGBTQ plus people, talk about human rights, talk about social justice, all of those wonderful things. But one of the clauses that was moved forward excluded trans folks. And so for the first time ever, 
organizations that are otherwise just like, oh no, well, trans issues are trans issues, go there, um, decided to not do that anymore because trans folks are consistently left out in the cold. Um, even though we're always the people at the front of the line, right? It's like, oh yeah, well, well now my company uses like pronouns in our signatures. Guess who, guess who had to be there and abused and misgendered <laughs> for that to be done? It's the trans and gender diverse people. Like you're actually being like she, her, I don't use pronouns. Okay, great, that's wonderful. It was us, we were the ones who were there getting abused, getting misgendered, um, getting fired um, in order for that to happen. And so for once folks said, well, if you're gonna do this to trans people, then we're not gonna sign on to this conference. And then organization after organization after organization was just like, hmm, we're not coming, uh, we're not doing this anymore. And the UK government was forced to cancel the conference. So if you're wondering what you can do in your various sectors um, to have a voice, sitting silent or being present and saying, no, I'm gonna shatter it from within is not the way to do it. Yeah. Um, I've got a, I've got a question. Um, do, do a lot of us know each other from course okay cool no um so let's bunch find of bunch of strangers let's get into groups of five just with people around you people that you've um maybe you count the people yeah i mean i can do it <laughs> i mean I'm you're like very, you're saying groups of five and music, do, do we know how many people we have you're very you're capable of like getting into groups of five um with people in the nearest um rows to you yeah Oh, is everyone shy? So I do that. Um, we're going to Yeah, we're going to just do like geographically. Um, yeah. We're in the room. <laughs> um, and then, no, no, no. You're, you're good. You're good. We're going to do it forward instead of forward. So two that way. Yeah, yeah. You three forward. Yeah. You're there. You thought you were just going to come and listen to me speak, didn't you? We will come back to that, which is going to have a little segue in terms of like deepening the tactics. Um, imagine it's 2050, 2050, so in uh, 28 years' time, um, there is no such thing as heteronormativity anymore or heterosexuality apart from in the museum. Um, it's a thing of the past. Um, there's not every single country in the world, it's it's legal to be queer. Um, sex work is decriminalized, drugs are, are decriminalized. Um, there's just a museum for colonial history. There's a museum for, he for heteronormativity um, where people can go and learn about what it was like back, th back now. Um, so it's, it's de decriminalized across the world. So does the context make sense? Okay. So how are we going to get there? How did we get there? What are the top five? <laughs> what are the top? What's the roadmap? What are the top like five stages that we need to do from all of our different geographical places in the world to to get to that utopia? And maybe actually, maybe it might not be a utopia. You can nuance that as well. Yeah. Does that make sense? That vision. So you've got five minutes. So a minute per point. Or maybe 10 minutes. No, no, no okay. five, five minutes. minutes. Dan likes to be very like, oh yeah, no. <laughs> five minutes. In these five minutes, again, you're doing like an executive strategy, right? We found out the aliens are coming and they're gonna take us away. And then when we come back, we must have a thing to like bring to the people in 28 years. So, 
a step-by-step -step plan. Great, grab a chair and like sit right here next to Kit, please. That's Kit. Um, so you've got five minutes, come up with five things. Somebody needs to have a pen, piece of paper, or if you're gonna be like one of those people, just type it on the phone. Um, but be pacific, as they like to say in Merca, right? So please be pacific about like, what what what's first what comes after that what comes after that what comes after that what comes after that and number five isn't the end it's just five all five yeah not world peace <laughs> but it is a step towards it Minuit, starting in a five, four, three, two, one, go. Okay, great. Um, if you're gonna get me wine, please can you get red. Great, thank you. Thank you. They don't necessarily have to be successive. Yeah. They might be that this needs to happen, this needs to happen, this needs to happen. It doesn't have to be after this happens, then this happens. Yeah?
going to talk a little while I wait for Dan um, so that he can hear your responses. And when I say I'm going to talk a little, it means I'm going to give you chances to ask me questions right now while I wait for Dan. It is open and it includes you people online. Hello, people. I'm available. Um, I know I try to like play myself down a lot, but really apparently i'm a big deal <laughs> so, <laughs> just just a little so ask me anything you want to ask me um how do we solve um i don't know like not having like seven and a half shoes in every single brand i don't know stuff like that any questions <laughs> ah, that's so nice. It feels so loaded. It feels like uh, feels like you're trying to like say things against other people. Uh, my name is Kakeho Kai Olanyani Hisukile. There are 17 letters in my surname, so don't whack. Um, but there are what? Yeah, 17 letters, 10 con like 10 syllables in there. Um, Siswana is a beautiful tonal language. So, Katleho means success, uh, and it therefore must be pronounced as it should be pronounced. 
otherwise you're mispronouncing success. And in Saswana, we have a saying that says, Ina which means your name is your calling. So mm -hmm. if you mispronounce my name, then that means you're mispronouncing my calling, which then means you are just cursing me. But yes, my name is Kaka Hopa Any other questions? Yes. If you read about the law for trans rights and women also coming rights, how would it look like? So, in drawing up a law for trans rights and gender non conforming persons' rights, for me, would be not doing it. And in that, I mean, I would ensure that all law is particularly accessible to trans and gender non-conforming persons and non-binary persons. So at no point does a law need to be interpreted to say, oh, but this could also mean, right? And I know that this is, so it's, it's, it sits at that strange thing with, um, I was talking to Dan earlier that in Eswatini, the kingdom of Eswatini, which is formerly known as Swaziland, um, the kingdom of Eswatini has refused the registration of Eswatini sex, sex and gender minorities, uh, ESGM, which is an organization. They've refused their registration because they say the constitution of the country covers everyone. But of course, interpretation of the constitution is exclusive. So for me, a law that would ensure that trans and gender diverse persons are seen, are validated, are protected, empowered, um, and of course not looking at folks I often talk about people experiencing marginality as opposed to marginalized persons because marginality is a thing that you are subjected to, right? Um, very often you, I remember when I moved here for the first time, people kept saying BAME. And like, so black, what, what is it, black, black, Asian and Minority ethnic. Minority ethnic? Maybe. Yes, and it's like, okay, so have you been to Buzwan? Like, <laughs> where's my minority ness in my ethnicity? Because it takes time for me to find a white person to see. <laughs> so from where I am, white people are a minority. So I'm the majority. So when I come here and then I get told I'm a minority, I'm just like, who's minority? When was a minority? Uh, so with those sorts of things, same thing with marginality, same thing with marginalized or minority communities. When it comes time to create laws that see us, they can't be laws that are sitting alongside laws that don't see us. All of the laws must see us. So that's what I would do. I would basically just tear everything else apart rather than introducing something new. And now Dan's here. So here we go with the report back. Everybody's going to report back. Mind you, you are not allowed to go into monologuing. Don't tell us why and how. And, mm -mm. You state the thing you're going to do, and you're going to do a sentence about the thing. Yeah, you've got five points. Thing, sentence. Next thing, sentence. Next thing, sentence. Everybody with me? Thing. Next thing. Next thing. Good. Um, does anybody have a name that starts with a letter between F and M? Great, Kat, your is gonna go first. <laughs> cool. Interesting observation I'm gonna make. 
nobody's allowed to comment about it. We're going to move on to the next people. Um, and Kath, while I speak, you get to pick who goes next. Oh, God. So one of the things that you said was very similar to what you did, <laughs> where it was, um, you're talking about safety for trans folks or non-binary folks at border posts. And the question is like, why do we not imagine that border posts could disappear? But we move on. Who's next, Kat? You would like to go, so that is, I, 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 I can get really bored of it. No, no, you're not, no, I'm we're not having a conversation. Really you need to say what your group said. Revolutionary education. Uh, Do you want to say a thing about the revolutionary education? education aspects towards the not just the structural education aspects, but really trying to make sure that people have access to the education that they need to be One. Um, policy change things that have a ripple effect of voting for voting change. Just uh, how to put out the experience. So I think that's a lot of the people who look at the design of the design. Wait, wait. You just de voiced. I, I couldn't hear anything. Okay, so I'm guessing yours is more progressive. Yeah. Because the borders are at the end. Yeah. Okay, cool. Media is the what fifth state, fourth state? What what do they call it? As the state, I really do I'm interested in the fact that you include media in your ideation of what must be done. As opposed to being like, mm, well, there's social media, which means nobody really can govern it. Next, you get to pick who goes <laughs> next. Oh, look at that. Uh, all right. So, uh, yes, we have five points of reform. The first is educational reform. Um, so, basically, I guess, centering sex ed, um, like, just like gender knowledge, just basically changing the entire educational system to decide the effect of So, we have uh, legal reform. Um, specifically, we talked about reducing the importance of marriage as I mean, first we were talking about involving more people in marriage, but then reducing, maybe in sense about reducing the importance of marriage so that it doesn't define immigration, inheritance, etc. Um, and yeah, just legal reform also around decriminalization. Then we had, we termed it as religious reform, um, but I guess it was more about separating religion and state as bare minimum, um, but also maybe thinking about getting rid of religion altogether. Um, <laughs> Offering. Okay. Um, then we also have political reform. So um, thinking about um, states that um, are under dictatorships or fascist regimes and thinking about like, democracy being at least, again, then all over the world. Um, and then lastly, we kind of had a bit of a talk about rethinking multilateralism or rethinking like the UN itself. But also the problem of Eurocentrism um, in how the world order is ordered um, and rethinking re where power is centered um, and how we can, I guess, dismantle that. So I guess, yeah. Okay. No, I'm, it's great. Uh, one of the weird things. Um, The split between religion and fanaticism, because fanaticism is what causes states to split, right? That whole like India and Pakistan situation. 
So that was fanaticism. It wasn't quite religion. It was fanaticism. Yes, I have some <laughs> thoughts about that. But I'm yeah, <laughs> um, it might be religion fueled fanaticism, but it's still <laughs> fanaticism. So the the point where it comes back to what is is it religion as the self? Is it religion as the the anchor? Or is it religion as the the lens or the weapon? But yes, we've got one last group. Did you say you're not allowed to speak? Now you're looking at me. I don't know. Hi. <laughs> Okay, because I was going to be like, uh, who's giving this money? Okay. Your sentences are so long, babe. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just because you have three doesn't mean you can like speed <laughs> ten <laughs> sentences. Okay, so we're so we're reforming our social system. And then number three education, our medical, our um, our social system. And then number three. Yeah, and number three is uh legal recognition. So yes, and that number three is legal recognition. And what we mean by that is a change in research and legislation that would be inclusive. Um, like you said, in dismantling what already exists. Cool. You have the floor with your own personal team. Standalone group. Yes. No, I'm just inspired by them, and then I'm just like, you know, from here, I guess so. And I want to speak as well, but I should be rushing to the room. That's my role today. Now, for me as well, I always kind of my takeaway is always about religion, because I always find. In any conversation I come across, especially in the middle of Africa, uh, it's always that big religious hurdle. So I would be so interested to know, to hear more about how can we dismantle that. And I understand that people, you know, you don't want to disrespect um, the fact that people have belief and what that belief gives them and uh, this idea of spirituality. I think that. Has to be, you know, that's not what I'm talking about. When I when talk about religion, I don't mean that. Mm. I mean the structure that they've been imposed on people and the kind of values that have been imposed on people's minds, and that has created this word that, you know, uh, that basically has people to be liberated in their minds. My point is liberate your mind from religion, this kind of link, and that, okay, you know, well, change your look, change in. Change the perspective, change the kind of social rules, but those things, yeah, I think happen once society and people start to think. And in many countries, especially in the African continent, religion has got such a powerful role. Contact somehow, WhatsApp or email or whatever. You should keep in touch because collating your ideas, I don't know, call it like Operation 2050, get rid of heteronormativity, whatever you want to call it, like start your own group and network. That's what I did at a uni when I was doing my undergraduate and masters, just create the groups if they don't exist already. Dan, the community builder. Exactly, do it, do it. And that's the first point. 
and then there, you, there might be, and just to throw it out there, two, two thoughts, right? If we want to build this global roadmap, what, and we need to obviously start where we're at and dig where we stand. Just one question is like, what needs to be changed at SOAS? Um, in the bigger picture, I <laughs> know, here we go. It was like, so much. What need, just to just to chuck it out there, like, if we want to create that world by 2050, give us one, because I'm genuinely quite clueless about what's going on internally at SOAS now. What are the top three things that need to transform? <laughs> here you go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, okay, I want to question that even further. When you say power from below as opposed to from above, what does power from below look like? And we can always talk about communities must do one, two, three, four, which puts the burden of strategy upon communities, right? You had a five minute exercise as a brand new community to put some things together, but that's a problem. When you're focused on ensuring that you can afford your heat bill, your water bill, your electric bill, bill. Um, make sure that your kid gets to school and doesn't get stabbed. What does that look like? Because it's all well and good to say the community must, but how? Because we're always great to talk about the what, but we never talk about the how. And the how is the most important. We can talk about decriminalization, right? Uh, and I'll go back to your country like Botswana. I've had numerous people say to me, um, you know, I, I love the work that you do, it's great, um, but please never expect to see me at any of your things. But if you need the resources, you know, I'll print things for you, I will cut things for you, I will. I will do everything else, but don't expect to see me there, right? So does that mean I have community? Does that mean I have community support? Is it solidarity? Yeah. I mean, I've got financing for it. Somebody's gonna print the balance. Great. But who's gonna hold the balance? Mm -hmm. Anybody else with a question, quest gesture? And I know I'm not, I, I know, I, please don't, don't be afraid of me. <laughs> Anybody? Tattoos. No, you're not allowed to talk about my tattoos. Oh, it's so good. You talk about your yellow button. Oh, I took that my yellow button. I guess the question, one last question for me is like, this is all very, um, it's, a, it, it's really useful, but if you have any like, really practical questions because I if it went in either when I was doing my undergraduate or my masters I wish I had like a one-on-one on how to continue um being an activist part-time full-time activist in one of the most expensive cities in the world like but if you have any like practical like super practical questions about how Kat has gone on to do all the incredible stuff that Kat's done like how you just that makes sense like break it down practical questions has anyone got that in terms of it could be money, it could be like networks in London, it could be how you do all beyond. Yeah, all beyond, yeah. No, I have a question. So um, like a very common debate in sorry, don't you mean uh Mazane. Mazane. Yeah. Okay, cool. So in No, did you say let me go? No, no, it was yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so a very common debate amongst the LGBT community in South Asia is on the idea of like identity and that like that decision with regards to identity. So for example, like uh, like in India, uh, where I live as well, most trans people, uh, people in the trans community, they don't have access to uh, citizenship, like legal citizenship, um, ID cards, mm. and 
Um, the common sort of debate there is that some people would prefer to avoid it because um, while you do get access, when you get access to citizenship, you do get access to benefits that you are owed um, and you have you deserve. But also, uh, it means that you come under surveillance. It means that you can be recorded, and that's also like um, harmful to you in many ways. So, uh, in terms of like fighting for these rights, which one should be fighting for is like a very common sort of thing that people come to. Mm. Um, I just want to know what your take is that. Yes. So it's very interesting. Um... One of the things that I, within my scholarship, um, write about is the difference between citizenhood and citizenship, right? So citizenhood is, do you feel as though you are seen and you are able to move without restriction within just that country? Then when it comes to issues of citizenship, it is what, what does your citizenhood afford you should you then start meddling with other countries? So if I were to, for example, Sierra Leone is one of the countries that has um, inherited a very, very aggressive penal code. Uh, in Sierra Leone, you, you can get arrested upon suspicion, right? You don't have to do any, anything, but upon suspicion, anyone's suspicion. So you walk in, you've got earrings that I like, and then I'm like, oh, hey, where'd you get those earrings? Then, like, you don't tell me. I feel like, I think that person's a lesbian. And the police don't need anything else from you except for the fact that I just said, I think you're a lesbian. And because I think you're a lesbian, surely you're a lesbian. And if you're not, you have to prove that you're not a lesbian. Therefore, we'll take you to jail anyway until you prove to us that you're not a lesbian, right? Um, and so when it comes to being seen by the state, as a trans-identifying Mofan, and I told you already that we are still struggling to get documents changed, gender markers changed, not never mind access to any sort of healthcare situations. Because again, in Mofana, it's universal healthcare. Everybody has access to healthcare, except trans people don't have access to trans-affirming healthcare. So we see that thing, right? So everybody has access to healthcare, but as a trans person, you don't have access to the healthcare that is directed to your particular need. So when it comes to that situation of are you documented or are you not documented? If you're not documented, what are the things that you then don't get access to? And for a lot of people, the things you don't get access to end up overpowering the things you do get access to as an undocumented person within your own country. So it's, it's a personal choice, but essentially, if you're not planning on traveling, which again, travel should never be the reason, why you engage with certain systems. But without those things, you're not going to be able to access some of the things that folks like me are advocating for, for us. So as much as I can advocate trans folks to get access to trans inclusive healthcare, to say to the healthcare system, like make sure that when there's a testosterone shortage globally, because again, this happened. I don't know if anybody knows this. How many people knew that there was a testosterone shortage across the world? Hands up high. I don't even like small hands, like big hands, big hands, all the way up, all the way up. Even if you didn't shake your arm, but show it, like me. Show it, show it, show it, show it. Show it. How many people knew? Okay, cool. So there's been a whole testosterone shortage across the world, 
ride. And the reason for that is because Pfizer was busy making COVID vaccines. Now, do we hate Pfizer? For the fact that like, like, they, they left, left like, like trans, trans men and people who needed testosterone boosters like in the cold? Or do we say, no, great, you saved my family's life. And it's very easy for folks to be like, oh, no, well, Pfizer should, no, 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 actually. <clears throat> You're busy making the vaccine. We got vaccinated. We're still alive. We're good. But the fact is, <coughs> even I, as a transmasculine person who got the vaccine, still needed my testosterone. So, <laughs> so it's like, which one of the two do you go for? Right. So things like that. We cannot advocate for access to things if folks are not there to be known as meaning access to them. So it has to be a personal choice. Yeah. Yeah. What is your question? <laughs> I am curious about um, your experience. So could you talk to me about how your trans identity intersects with you being know, you know, a Black African advocating in the first world? Like, could you really do any need to do it? And the times you've been an advocate in the US and all the work that you've done, how, how did that, how did that, how do those things interact? Like, what are the differences between your experience maybe, and someone else who maybe is a card holding British white person? Um, how do you think that those that experience is different and uh, how they interact in your life? Thanks for that question. Being um, as a Black history man. Yeah, yeah, it's a Black history man. Um, and unfortunately, in Africa, we can't have Black history man because. <laughs> like we are blessed. <laughs> um, so it's been very, very. very I don't want to call it weird, but the mere fact of the matter is, I am a person born in Francestown, Botswana. Uh, France Town used to actually just be a rail post, so it wasn't a city. And then it became more kind of obscure second city. Um, but growing up in that obscure second city, I was. You've been to France Town. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought you'd be like, yeah. So. Um, growing up there, but still not necessarily getting what a lot of people think of as the Black experience, right? So it's like, okay, grew up with the television in the house, um, I played tennis competitively, played chess competitively, <laughs> and not as like an out of school program, not as to keep me off the street, it was go and compete in tennis, go and compete in chess, go and compete in swimming. Um, so those sorts of senses of privilege, I had to start making sense of much later in life, uh, and more so when I moved to South Africa, because South Africa has such a, a polarized relationship between what you can afford and what your skin is and your culture and your language and your personage and all these other things. And I was like, well, I'm a Mozana who speaks Swahili and I also have like a bit of a twang and all of these things are happening, but like I'm not trying to be white. So, so just because I listen to Fall Out Boy, it doesn't mean I don't believe in like blackness. Um, so there was that that preempted me entering world politics. So by the time the world politics came to be, I was like, but I'm still a person in the world. I have access 
to my kin, my siblings, my cousins who experience the Black experience. And because of that, I'm able then to, to know that some of this isn't about like, oh, I'm doing it for me. I'm doing it for my nieces, I'm doing it for my nephews, I'm doing it for my cousins. Because I know that should they ever need this, the way needs to be made. It can't be, oh, well, then they're going to have to come and do it for themselves. Um, so the diplomatic speak, even when I'm doing my diplomatic speak, I am bringing the fact that I can do this, but I'm also very conscious of the fact that there's somebody who's not going to be able to do this. And I'm speaking for myself and expressing what I hope they would want to say. I'm not going to say I'm speaking on their behalf because I nobody can ever do that. It would be absolutely false if somebody could think that they could speak on my behalf. So why would I think that I can speak on anybody else's behalf? So yeah, that's how it's been moving. Have I finished answering the question? Or is it still a little bit more missing? Because when it comes to you know um, sitting with with heads of states, representatives of states, um, those are spaces that you get afforded. Um, they're not a day to day. You get afforded the opportunity. I remember. Um, okay, I'm going to finish the first part, and then I'll tell you the other thing. So you get afforded this opportunity, right? So. Uh, we were we were meeting with a certain state that we were trying to get into a partnership to go, and it was a whole policy, it's a whole high level, high level, high level. <laughs> nobody, this is the reason why I can't tell me which state it is or where we were meeting. But we're trying to get this state to join a small, very special group. Um, and of course, while we're having this meeting, we must pander to them before <laughs> we start making our demands. And me being catch and saying, we ain't got time. Nobody got time there. I was like, okay, cool. You did really great, but, and then I went in with all of the, like, you didn't do this well, you didn't do this well, you didn't do this well, these are opportunities, these are opportunities, these are opportunities. And I wasn't saying you're doing terribly, but I was saying, here are your opportunities. Um, after the meeting, the people who are very well versed in the, oh yes, you know, oh, thank you so much for having us and we're so grateful that you were doing <laughs> such a wonderful <laughs> job. Um, and uh, we know it's really difficult and you we've seen the efforts that you've been putting in and I was like, I don't have time. I'll tell you the opportunities, take them, don't take them. That's a new thing, it's not a new thing. Those people then said to me, that you did well to get the meeting done in the period of time that we had. Because again, you've been told you've got 10 minutes. So what am I gonna do? I spend five minutes like telling you how wonderful you are. No. I'm going to do two minutes to be like, oh, great, go. Because we've got five minutes of us telling you what we need, and then at least maybe two and a half minutes of you responding. And when you respond, has anybody ever sat with a diplomat in a room? Hands up. Right. Diplomats speak like this. You know, thank you so much for. Uh, being here, and we appreciate the work that you're doing. Uh, as the entity that we are, we are always so uh, proud and encouraged and inspired <laughs> by people. <laughs> I'm steady! Right? So they'll take two and a half minutes just saying the, oh, yeah, well, you know. We're happy that you're here. So I knew that we didn't have time. And I got scolded by the people who know how to do the, 
Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, it's so wonderful, it's so wonderful. Oh, yes, they're great, they're great. She's like, oh, you're great. Um, because I went straight to the point. And of course, it's very difficult to think about whether or not you go straight to the point or you then say, no, we play the long game. And the long game is hoping that you'll be proposed to when you've already bought the ring. And it's pointless. But with that, there was also a moment, I ended up sitting next to like the crown prince of Norway or something of the sort, many years ago. But I'm sitting next to this person and we're having this chat, beautiful chat, about things we care about, about changes we want to see happen in the world. And I didn't know that they were part of the royal family, <laughs> but they are. <laughs> and then I also didn't know that they were the person, well, one of the two people who was going to be leading the discussion we were about to get into. And then when we get into the discussion, they're referencing the conversation we had, oh. right? So it's very easy to think, um, no, I will know when the moment of importance is. But the fact is you'll be sitting next to some blonde person wearing like a blue shirt and jeans <laughs> and they've got more power than somebody who's going to walk in with an entourage uh, with briefcases and you always have to like schedule time to sit with them. So never think you know when the moment of importance is. Just go and don't almost yourself. Just say it. Say it if they don't take it. Mm -hmm. It's a them thing, not a you thing. Any questions? Yes. So my question is Sorry, I like to just like Speak Yeah, 16. Six, six years. Like, six years. Okay. Six years yeah, amazing. In Paris and Japan. Oh. And like, as someone who has lived in here and was doing masters in the UK, and then they helped me a lot to come here. Like, I'm been thinking at questions like, why I'm here and what I can do for the community or with the community. And like, uh, like, do you have any like, advice or like the regarding the situation? Like, what I should do here? Oh, mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So do you know that you're still, so the UK is still a country that criminalizes sex work. Yeah, you know this, right? Yeah. Um, but the weird thing with the UK and its criminalization of sex work is that it's not that sex work is criminal. Yeah. It's just that certain orchestrations of sex work. So um, I don't know if people know this, but you can be a sex worker, but as if two sex workers live in the same premises, then it's considered a brothel and brothels are illegal. Mm -hmm. So sex work is legal, but brothels are illegal. So now you're basically not allowed to have anyone as security. Um, so that's one of the weird things about where you are right now. But the thing that you can do for the community and with the community is the very thing that we always say with regards to like folks who are allies who are just like, well, what can I do for like for the community? It's like, just don't think you're gonna save the community, right? Like just firstly, nobody needs your saving. Folks are doing what they do how they do it, the most important thing is assisting them to get what they want. <laughs> so whether it is access to legal counsel while you're here, that's great. So you can find and create networks <laughs> of people who are willing to provide pro bono or whatever kind of legal counsel for sex workers in, um, China and, did you say China and Japan? No, or Thailand and Japan. Thailand and Japan. 
Okay, cool. So Thailand, Japan, finding legal counsel that is willing and able to do the work there, right? Because it's all one good for somebody to be like allowed to practice in the UK, but it's not the same. Um, if it means creating relationships between firms where you might think that there's more expertise here and um, somebody who can actually go to court in Thailand or in Japan to do that, that's fine. It's still a little bit colonial, but at least it's, it's something, right? Um, it, we, nobody really needs to be extradited to come and do sex work in a foreign country because who says they don't want to see their favorite nieces or nephews or cousins or go to their favorite beach? Like I might just not want to leave the country simply because there's a person who makes the best pancakes down the road. And I'm not willing to give up those pancakes just so that I don't have to run away from the cops, right? But that's the thing. You need to firstly let go of any guilt you feel about the fact that you're here. They've assisted you. You are one of their products. Your job now is to continue the work. They wouldn't have invested in you if they didn't believe in you. So they've done the investment, give them the return on investment. And that return on investment is getting what you came for and then continuing the work. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Kat, for inspiring us as ever.